Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the UF Law eDiscovery Conference, March 2021. Uh, great to have you all with us as we head into the final sessions this afternoon. Next is privacy. If there's anything we're concerned about is privacy right now. We've got new statutes. We've got new regulations. We've got COVID surrounding us. And we've got the surveillance state looking at us. So let's, let's talk about, let's get the privacy panel out here right now if you'll join me. And let's talk about what's happening and what we in eDiscovery need to worry about in terms of privacy. Uh, this panel is going to be moderated by Chris Dix. Of, of Smith Holsey. Uh, Chris is a triple gator. Three cheers. Uh, it's all yours, Chris. Take it away. Please introduce your panel and run with it. We, we, we can't wait. All right. Can you hear me? We can. All right. Perfect. I had a little bit issue with my screen there. Thanks, Bill, so much. Looking forward to this panel. So uh, I'm an attorney up in, in Jacksonville, Florida at Smith Holsey and Busey. My practice includes all things digital from e-discovery, uh, data security, cybersecurity, data breaches, and also sports arbitration cases. We prosecute professional tennis players who are involved in match fixing or some other kind of corruption. And as you might imagine, all the evidence related to those cases is digital in some way. And so uh, the, the way that I do things, it, it, it often involves electronic discovery and, and digital evidence in some way. What I want to do first is go back to something that I heard Judge Matthewman talk about at the beginning of the conference, and that was the profound impact that COVID-19 has had on our lives from the way that we practice law, the way that we go to work or, or don't go to work, the way that we our kids go to school. Um, it just every form of the way that we live our life has been impacted. Um, and, and, you know, one thing that we want to talk about for the privacy panel is how is privacy impacted by all of those different changes that are so profound? On the one hand, you know, you've got lots of people that were very interested in knowing Who's got the virus? Who have they been around? What places were they visiting before they got sick? You've got contact tracers uh, trying to figure out some of the answers to those questions. And on the other hand, if you were at a company or a school or a religious organization or any type of uh, group, you're walking that fine line between trying to protect people that might have been exposed, um, maybe for someone that was at your school or, or company or organization. You're also trying to avoid disclosing too much information. Uh, you, you can't necessarily disclose everything about everybody that you know as a company, even if people really want to know that. And so let me start by sharing my screen here. There we go. So since this is a privacy panel, what we want to do first is to go back and, and go back and think about the time before COVID. There were two privacy frameworks that were in place at that time uh, before COVID was ever around. First was the GDPR in the European Union, and the next was the California law, uh, CCPR we call it. We don't have enough time to cover all those frameworks in their entirety. And I'm assuming at this point in the day, no one wants to hear us talk in, in great detail about all those frameworks. But what we are going to do today is talk about the key provisions and how they impact e-discovery. Next, we're going to talk about privacy from the in-house perspective, uh, including some of the changes that have arisen as a result of the pandemic as people are now working remotely. Lots of different things happening there. We're going to finish up the hour by talking about some recent cyber security issues and cyber attacks. All along the way, our goal is to make sure we follow the goal of the conference, which is to help you work smarter, not harder. Well, what I want to do before we get to our panelists, I do want to introduce who they are. First up is going to be Taylor Hoffman. He's Senior Legal Counsel, Head of eDiscovery Management at Swiss Re. He's also Chair Emeritus of a Sedona Conference Working Group on International Information Management, Discovery, and Disclosure. He's probably the best person we could have had. Great job, Bill, for, for inviting such a great panel. Um, but he, he's going to talk to us today about GDPR and the impact on e-discovery. Next up is going to be Debbie Reynolds. Debbie is the founder and CEO and chief privacy, data privacy officer of Debbie Reynolds Consulting. You may know Debbie by her nickname. She's the data diva, and she's a world-famous technologist, thought leader, and advisor companies big and small. She's going to talk to us about how privacy laws are changing uh, in California and what the impact that might have. Next up is going to be Brian Corbin. He's the executive director and assistant general counsel at J.P. Morgan Chase. He works on e-discovery, regulatory matters, investigations all over the world. Brian's based out of Buenos Aires, Argentina, which I think if we were to all have traveled to Gainesville for the conference this year, Brian would probably have been the person that traveled the farthest to appear in person in Gainesville, but we're glad to have him and everybody else here virtually today. 
Last but certainly not least is Kenya Parrish Dixon. Uh, she's the general counsel and chief operating officer of Empire Technologies Risk Management Group. She's worked in several different positions within the United States government. She was at the Federal Trade Commission, more recently at the director of the White House Information Governance for the Executive Office of the President. So she's got some great stories to tell us today. Um, and, and she's also going to be speaking <laughs> on the next panel. Um, so you get two, two opportunities to hear Kenya speak. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Taylor to talk about GDPR. So Taylor, tell us a little bit about GDPR and some of the implications of GDPR for e-discovery professionals. Thanks, Chris. I uh, am really thrilled to be here. Uh, I am going to note that the original title of this panel was Privacy in a Pandemic. And now a lot of folks are coming from Florida. I live in a small Manhattan apartment with a wife, two kids, and a dog. So I can definitely tell you there is no privacy in a pandemic. Uh, but there are still data protection regulations and there's still e-discovery. And also, this is my first UF uh, e-discovery conference. And in prepping for it, uh, Professor Hamilton indicated that this shouldn't be a march through the GDPR and regulations, but instead uh, an engaging knowledge transfer. So indulge me with one quick and I promise you relevant Gators story. Back in law school, I really wanted a clerkship with a particular judge, and he sat in Jacksonville, Florida. When I went for my interview, I was shocked that I had to spend 800 bucks a night for a room at a La Quinta Inn. And this wasn't a fancy La Quinta, mind you. And so in small talk with one of the clerks, I mentioned this, and she responded, um, you know, it's rivalry weekend, don't you? <laughs> and she explained that the Georgia UF rivalry game was held in Jacksonville because it's quote, halfway between Georgia and Florida. I made the mistake of asking, aren't we in Florida? So let me save everyone some time of checking my LinkedIn profile. I did not clerk on the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, so while a brief digression, it does illustrate a theme of great import to this section of the panel. And that is what's obvious to some is utterly foreign to others. So now, getting back to the GDPR, what I want to do now is highlight two common surprises for each main player in a U.S. litigation with EU data. I want to talk about in-house U.S. counsel for the producing party, outside counsel in the U.S. litigation for the producing party, the European colleague of the producing party, uh, the U.S. Requesting Parties Council, and fifth, gingerly, tentatively, the bench. So these surprises will illustrate a number of requirements. That, that was a warning not to talk about the bench. I'm going to skip the fifth one and let you know I live above a firehouse. So, um, but these surprises will illustrate a number of uh, requirements in the GDPR are relevant to conducting uh, discovery in U.S. litigation. Um, before we get to those surprises, it's helpful to highlight the stark contrast between the priorities uh, of the two regimes. Uh, you can't understand your client without knowing where she's coming from or the competing challenges, challenges she's facing. First, on the U.S. side, um, as you know, <laughs> Discovery is famously broad even after the 2015 uh, amendments to the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. Why so broad? At least in part of the notion that discovery, evidence, can lead to truth and can help achieve justice. Let's get to the merits of the litigation. It may be expensive and intrusive, but it's a solid end goal. Now in contrast, not only do the civil law countries of the EU have extremely limited discovery, but privacy is a fundamental human right. You don't have to be a World War II scholar to have an appreciation for the genesis of this. However, we need to distinguish the GDPR from true European blocking statutes, which were specifically targeted at precluding discovery in the US. To highlight this contrast, it's important to note that uh, European localities, politicians, and the like have been fined under the G GDPR. 
But we're lucky to have received some guidance from the European Data Protection Board on cross-border discovery. Discovery wasn't even on the radar for its implementation. So these starkly different perspectives uh, can lead to many surprises. That dynamic is great for sitcoms, but it can be disastrous in litigation. So let's get started. Who could be surprised and how? As for the who, in short, Literally everybody involved in the process could be if they haven't done their homework. Each of these that, that I'm gonna get to are real life examples involving intelligent and highly compensated individuals working on US litigation with European data. So let's start with in-house US counsel from the producing party. Among many potential surprises, let me highlight two. First, the scope of data covered by the GDPR. I once had difficulty convincing an in-house counsel that simply the work-related email address of an employee was personal data and covered by the GDPR. You'd assume that there was a higher threshold of sensitivity would apply, or that employees wouldn't assume that their work email addresses would be considered personal data. But it is. Any information that can directly or indirectly identify an individual is. Surprise. This had implications for every manner in which the data was touched, getting us to the second example for in-house counsel. Namely, simply issuing a legal hold on a data subject to the GDPR's processing data. Um, and this requires specific demonstrable legal justifications for doing so. What's the surprise here? You don't have to transfer the data out of the EU. You don't have to copy the data. You don't have to review the data. Simply extending retention is processing. And if you're processing data, you need a legal basis for doing so. Surprise. Next up, who else is surprised? Of course, the producing party's outside counsel. I once had my outside counsel gasp. You can't get me that data next week? Nope. Outside counsel sat on dis a discovery request and his failure to plan suddenly became my problem. And mind you, this was sophisticated outside counsel from one of the top firms in the world with, by the way, offices in the EU and an e-discovery practice group. Getting data out of the EU requires safeguards and safeguards take a plan and time. Not happening tomorrow. Surprise. Two uh, sidebar notes uh, to outside counsel who may be watching. First, this isn't great client relations. Second, your credibility is also on the line when you're getting up before the judge. So a second counsel, a second surprise for outside counsel of the producing party, merely pr providing remote access counts as a data transfer out of the EU. So let's say you think you had every safeguard in place, transparency with data subjects, in-country calling, in-country review, but your US counsel wants to review on the vendor's EU-based platform. Yes, providing that access is indeed a transfer, even if the actual documents are never transferred to the US. Guess what? Surprise. Next, the European colleague whose data may be transferred to the US. First, just the sheer scope of discovery can be a huge surprise. I was consulting with a European colleague on a matter and noted that opposing party produced approximately a million documents. His eyes grew large and he said to me, tell them to send it back and give us only what we need and is relevant. Um, we had a conversation about the scope of US discovery. Uh, he was in fact surprised, but when was he more surprised? When that scope applied to his data. Second, the extent of the onward transfer. So under the GDPR, transparency is required and that transparency will likely come as a surprise. 
the data may go to an e-discovery vendor, outside counsel, the requesting party, the opposing party, perhaps in a, used in a deposition, the bench. Surprise, it's out there. The requesting party, also surprised. So the requesting party likely doesn't even know where your data may be. They may assume it's stateside, not subject to the GDPR, and relatively uncomplicated to access. In addition to being potentially surprised by where the producing party's data may be, the requesting party may be surprised by the safeguards and mechanisms to facilitate cross-border transfer. Whether it be what's reasonable to include, what's in a protective order, or what the Hague Convention may even be. Finally, the bench, actually hoping that there's going to be another siren coming up, but first, surprising the judge is never a good idea. Never fail to abide by a scheduling order because the parties didn't inform the judge that there were cross-border data regulations complicating the discovery. Second, some of the peculiarities of data protection regulations can surprise some judges who don't specialize in this area. One example, there can be data in the US Leg legally under binding, binding corporate regulations or standard contractual clauses, neither of which permit onward in-country transfer. So imagine being in a U.S. courthouse with the data on your phone. Oh, it's not working. There we go. We get, you, you can see it now. Um, data on your computer or phone. But then you have to explain you can't provide that data because it would constitute a cross-border transfer. Your Honor, if I were making up an excuse, trust me, it would be better than this. So, all right, next slide. GDPR. Taylor, I gotta move us on pretty quickly oh, sorry. here. Go for it. In order to make sure everybody gets a, gets a chance to talk about their title, we got a ton of stuff to cover. So if you can uh, wrap it up real quick, uh, we'll move on. If we have time at the end, we'll come back. Promise. So I'll just do second slide. It's about safeguards, 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 whether it's phase discovery, protective order, um, or whatever else you got. And go ahead. Take it away, Chris. Awesome. Thanks so much, Taylor. That was great. Uh, Debbie, let's turn it over to you. Tell us about privacy laws in California. How are things uh, shaping up out there? How are they maybe different? And how are they impacting e-discovery? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you um, to all. Uh, thank you to Taylor uh, for that. Um, that information about GDPR. I have lived that uh, very much. So I think uh, California is very interesting. California is a very influential state. We know that the CCPA uh, went into effect um, in 2020 and that they recently passed a law with the CPRA uh, that goes into effect in 2023 that will make CCPA uh, a much more like the GDPR in bringing things like a, um, a agency within California to be able to help uh, manage the privacy uh, issues that happen or consumer issues uh, that actually get put up to those agencies. Uh, Another parallel, I think, to GDPR is kind of having a purpose to data transfer and a consent mechanism in terms of onward transfer, whether that be sale or sharing. Uh, the, the CPRA actually added data sharing because there was a confusion with CCPA with people about data sharing. Um, in terms of e-discovery, I think, um, maybe CCPA is kind of like the canary in the coal mine in terms of what we expect to see coming up with more states passing regulations doing having to do with consumer data. A lot of times in the legal situation, and uh, this is part of what Taylor was uh, speaking about, was if you have data that has particular privacy laws related to it based on the location of where the data is or the location where the custodian is, it's important that you know that right away uh, and that, you know, as opposed to maybe previously e-discovery 
we just gather a bunch of data and then we figure out what we want to do with it later. Uh, these other laws, uh, including the ones at a state level, may require a lot more planning and preparation before you actually touch the data and before you uh, start doing anything with the data. Uh, one thing that I, I recommend or I've seen done or I've done in eDiscovery is if there's data that has particular privacy laws that are related to it, I would um, segment those things out so that creating almost like a parallel path in discovery. So one path would be the data that uh, d doesn't have any strict regulations or any issues or restrictions to it. And then that other path would be things that do have those strict things. So in that way, if you're doing it on a parallel path, you're giving yourself a chance to be able to do things like a review and produce data and continue on with that while you're actually working on, uh, you know, per perhaps getting whatever consents that you need to, to have, uh, gathering, you know, the data. Uh, I think also one other thing that happens with data, especially either in cross-border or in a situation where you're restricted in the type of data that you have, I think it's important to note that you don't have, that you know, that, that the set of data you have is what you are able to, to get, but it may not be complete because there may be certain uh, restrictions in terms of either uh, the data wasn't collected uh, or the data is restricted in some way. So I think, you know, from either sub e-discovery perspective, what happens is when we're working with a company, they will typically be a data controller. So as a data controller, they are the ones that, that say what needs to happen to that data. But if you're processing or doing anything else with the data, uh, they will typically have you sign maybe a processing agreement or come to agreement before they actually turn that data over to get an idea of what you're going to do with the data in that process and that you understand what uh, rules or regulations that have to apply to that. Because, for example, if someone has a consumer complaint or complaint of any type about how their data is handled, it really is incumbent upon the uh, data controller to be able to answer that stuff, but at you as a data processor, quote unquote, uh, you may be subject to assisting the controller to be able to answer those questions. So being able to have a plan in place, a place, a process in place before you actually start doing things with data that you think has some type of data privacy regulations will help you a lot uh, in the end. And again, pointing back to what Taylor said, you don't want anybody surprised. So if you feel like you have a case that has some type of uh, either multinational dimension or some type of uh, data privacy regulation, it's, it's good to actually bring that up uh, early on in a case. Uh, so at least that they're aware. But you do also don't want that to stop you from the rest of the work that you're doing on the case. So if there are low-hanging fruit things that you can start producing or there are custodians that don't have those restrictions that you, you can start producing, that will at least help, help uh, you know, goodwill, if nothing else, to be able to get data out and be able to comply with the request of the court. Debbie, we had a question from one of our attendees. They asked, are there special obstacles for discovery across borders in states, like in the United States, uh, like Florida that has a constitutional right of privacy? Any, any thoughts on cross-border transfers when we're talking about one state to another rather than one country? Currently, no, uh, I'm not seeing that um, because a lot of times when, uh, because a lot of times when you're dealing with say corporations, a lot of the requests that they get, they do have rights to transfer that data, especially if it's employee data. So I think their rights in actually holding that information, as long as it doesn't have kind of these other blocking things in other countries, you can actually transfer that data. So I'm not seeing state to state problems with data transfer. Uh, I do think that, you know, most people who are doing e-discovery and doing it with uh, companies that have data in the U.S., you'll probably start to see more agreements where they're saying maybe you won't be subject or, or you may not 
be the person that has to answer a complaint or something from someone. But, you know, they'll make you aware that we are or, you know, they are as a company. So you may see some of your contracts change as a result in terms of them saying, you know, here are, here are our obligations, you know, for the data. And then here is a way that if, you know, if we have to, you know, uh, give data to a regulator or if we have to do data subject access requests, this is something we may ask you to do as the person that's doing a service for us. One more question for, for this is for anybody in the group. Uh, does the panel have any take on the appetite for a uniform national privacy law? Any thoughts on that? So I don't know about a uniform privacy law, but um, if you look at NIST, NIST has put out a privacy uh, framework that came out in 2020, similar to the cybersecurity framework that NIST um, had put out previously. And so there are national guidelines for privacy that are out there now from the federal government, not so much as, as a law or regulation over the country as a blanket, um, we probably won't see that. We haven't seen that with cybersecurity. We probably are not going to see it with uh, privacy, but certainly when it comes to liability with regards to, to privacy, um, if you have not put the, the items from the, the, the privacy framework in place, then you're not meeting the standard of care or the industry standard as it's been set out by NIST. So certainly, um, you know, the government doesn't want to have an overarching blanket of privacy, but it really does want to give you guidelines that, that you should follow as an industry standard. All right. All right, Brian, you're up. Um, you know, some of our attendees are sitting there today. They, they work at law firms. They may be sitting at home working at a law firm virtually. Uh, they want to know what, about what's going on in-house. Uh, so what can you tell us? How are things like in-house uh, as an attorney? What are some of the challenges you're facing and how has the panic, pandemic kind of impacted e-discovery from your perspective? Sure, thanks, Chris. And I, I'll, I'm gonna mix things around here a little bit. First of all, I just, I have to give my disclaimer. I don't speak directly on behalf of JP Morgan. My comments are from my own experience. Um, secondly, it, I need to mention that I am a Florida State University graduate and a lifelong member of the Florida State University Marching Chiefs. And I came prepared with all sorts of regalia. And then I got spooked at the last second about trademark issues. So Scott Milner can count himself lucky that I'm not just spending my entire time hating all over him in the fine institution of the University of Florida. That said, um, I actually want to pivot back really quickly to uh, a previous uh, discussion with uh, Jared Caselia, um, who is our e-discovery job guru, who I just want to point out had 15 minutes to talk about the e-discovery job market. And what did he lead off with? Privacy. It is a big deal in our industry. And I think professionals who are well-versed in privacy are doing themselves a great favor. Um, there is so much of this that's getting in intermingled with um, what we discovery practitioners are doing. Um, it's been there for a while. I only see it growing both internationally and especially domestically, as we mentioned. Um, so again, I just, I, I really like that he focused on that right off the bat. Lastly, before I dive into this, um, to the audience, please ask us questions. I think that's going to really help us and, and get you the information you need and that you're curious about as well. So I'm going to briefly touch on kind of my perspective being in-house. So I, I work obviously in a massive law department. I've been working either in or for massive law departments for a long time, and it's, it's a slightly different animal, but the issues we deal with are all the same. And what I wanted to talk about right off the bat is how do you operationalize data privacy workflows or risk management workflows, et cetera, regardless of whether that's related to a GDPR or something in the States or in even different countries where I sit. Um, and it's kind of two approaches that I, I wanted to focus on. One is um, something that I use in my own work that really helps me solve problems. And that is principles of, it's called design thinking. In a nutshell, what this is, it's getting obsessive about a problem before you try to build any sort of solution to that problem. Because as we know, especially as corporate practitioners, it's really easy to throw technology at a problem or to throw a new workflow at a problem or to assume we know a lot about what the solution should be. And I think privacy is a great example of something that is pretty company and industry specific for the way you need to resolve it, depending on where you sit and depending on which role you sit in, whether you're in-house 
or if you're advising somebody in-house to really get obsessive about what exactly needs to be done and what those risks are. And one of the, a good way to do this, um, it's certainly relevant to discovery is data mapping or risk assessments. Um, it's just, it's so important as discovery practitioners and those of us who have to manage privacy risks to know where our data is. And again, we can assume so much about what our employees, or again, if you're a practitioner, what your clients are doing. And let's limit this discussion just to e-communication channels, for example. We heard a lot from the last panel about, um, about um, small messages, I, I forgot the term, but you know, chats, IMs, ephemeral messaging, which Kenya is gonna talk about in a few minutes. Um, we have this problem, to Dan Regard's point, of, of the delta of these communication channels spreading. And if you're not mapping those, if you or your clients are not aware of where these things sit and how they're being governed, whether that's actually physically via um, cybersecurity controls or data loss prevention controls or rigorously governed policy, you're running an incredible risk in my opinion. Um, the other big element of this from what I see is people. Those of us who were involved in kind of the early days of discovery have seen this play out. You've got to build kind of a coalition of teams, plural, within in-house departments in order for an e-discovery depart uh, department or function um, to, to perform well. You need all of these different stakeholders involved and lightning bolts from the top very often in order to get people to comply with a legal hold or to put a collection protocol in place or to do all the things we need, need to do to practice defensible discovery. Privacy from an operational perspective, it's very similar. You need your records and information team on board. They need to know what's going on. Your cybersecurity team is an extremely close partner of this. Your data archiving, your risk management, et cetera. It's all these same facets of kind of your information governance portfolio of functions that have to partner to get privacy right if it's going to work. The same thing we had to do in discovery not all that long ago. So just from an organizational and operational perspective, there are a lot of parallels, and a lot of skill sets that we discovery folks have built over these years that apply pretty directly to operationalizing privacy. I would add project management rigor and metrics definitely uh, to that list. Um, a couple other things I'll say is that, again, just knowing where to find e-communication channels, I just can't stress it enough for both discovery, for regulated companies, again, Kenya's going to hit that as well, um, but also for privacy. Um, and as we get into these, these kind of non-standard channels that aren't emails, that aren't, you know, your, your corporate instant messaging devices, when you're getting into mobile devices, Slack, uh, WhatsApp, they, they get more and more personal from what we see, just in, in normal everyday practice. And that then, again, increases privacy risk. It's something that we as practitioners need to be attuned to and need to pull in the right people to manage those risks. So we go to the next, next slide, please. I'll talk uh, briefly, briefly about DSARs. Uh, so DSARs are data subject access requests. And the reason I think they're important for us to, to talk about in, in today's program is that I think it's easy for them to get lumped in with discovery, whether they belong there and with those teams and with that function or not. And it's something that I think discovery practitioners need to be aware of and kind of on the lookout for because they tend to be a hot potato because the function can look similar to discovery but I think the, the, the gotcha moment here, to Taylor's point, surprise, you have to do 100 of these per month or per week, depending on which industry and where you're located. Um, it could be an operational nightmare if you're not ready for that. If you haven't set the expectation that you're going to need more resources, you're going to need more time to do these. And time is of the essence with these. And like I said, these, these rights arise from uh, laws and regulations like the GDPR, like the CPRA, for example. And again, I think these will only grow, these rights will grow, these customer requests will grow. And it's something that e-discovery practitioners, it, whether you're taking these on or not, it's important to be aware of them at the, at the bare minimum and get ready to negotiate around them. Um, and again, just to clarify those responsibilities with your internal and external stakeholders early and often as the laws change. Um, Frank, so, you know, Frank, with that, sure. Oh, go, go ahead. Go, it, it, we're running out of time. Go ahead. Doug. I was going to wrap it up anyway. So, you know, Kenya is about to talk about some non-standard channels. And again, as e-discovery practitioners, we need to be following the data. 
ephemeral messaging channels, for example, Slack, Teams, these, these arising new platforms that are, that are going to be widespread across corporate America, we need to be in front of these both from an e-discovery perspective, but especially as a, 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 from a privacy perspective as well. Kenya, let me hand it over to you. Thank you, Brian. That was, that was great. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. If you'd go to the next slide, please. Sorry. There we go. So I want to talk a little bit about ephemeral apps that we refer to them as ephemeral apps in the industry, but really they are disappearing apps or applications where the data is encrypted so that you can't get it out or data that is um, that that as you're you're transferring it from one from one person to another, it is not stored on any server any place. And so the data disappears basically once the time is up. The, there are some interesting things about these ephemeral apps. Um, one, they make it difficult to preserve uh, the data. So putting legal holds in place sometimes can be really very difficult uh, because the data was never, you know, was never kept any place. Uh, it makes it difficult to collect the data if there is no place to collect it from. And then, of course, if you can't preserve it, collect it, review it, um, then you can't produce it. And so ephemeral apps are really very um, interesting. They are created primarily because of an effort to obtain more privacy. Um, and so they are really kind of a, a tool of privacy, but they make it really difficult for you to, for, from an e-discovery standpoint, to get a hold of that data and know what's happening with it. It's very common for people in a workplace to use ephemeral apps one-to-one. -one. And sometimes you'll find whole departments are on um, a particular app together having conversations about work, and everyone in the department is aware of that, but management is not aware of it. And so it becomes really difficult to do, figure out what you're going to do with that, with that data if you don't even know that it exists, right? Um, so one of the interesting things is that you, it's difficult to put a legal hold on, uh, on data that has not been kept in the normal course of business, all right? So if you don't keep this data in the normal course of business and you want to put a legal hold on it and there is no data to put a legal hold on, you ask yourself, should I even issue the legal hold? The answer is yes. You always issue the legal hold. Why? Because even when an app tells you that it does not keep the data, nine times out of ten, it keeps it for a very small period of time before the data disappears. It's a time frame issue. So if you put a legal hold in place that says you must keep this data and the application would normally have the data just fall away or disappear after 10 minutes, an hour, 24 hours, three days, then now that data has to be kept. Now, for the application, it becomes a really difficult issue because now they've got to figure out how to, how to collect and store all that data, but that's not your problem. Always issue the legal hold. Always issue the legal hold. Always subpoena data if you know that there's an ephemeral app that could be used. Um, this is an issue that when you're doing depositions, you should be asking about. Are you... Don't use the term ephemeral app <laughs> because a lot of people don't know what that means. I always say disappearing app um, because you'll find that creative people, creative departments are finding ways to work with one another. It, there is no enterprise-wide application in that department or in that organization, but a number of people have individual private accounts and are working together. Even if it violates company policy, government policy, whatever, People are just looking for an easier way to do their jobs. So subpoena all data from all applications, issue legal holds for all um, ephemeral apps that you discover, um, and um, ask, one of the things you should always ask if you are a party in a matter is whether or not you have produced any portion of the data in that app to a third party. Now, why would you ask that question? Because the government collects data from from applications and from organizations. Um, and so the, the government may have all of the data and you may want to FOIA that data. 
from the government because it was not kept in the normal course of business. And so this is like a little trick of the trade is that you ask, have you produced this data uh, or allowed the government to take any of this data? And if that's the case, then you FOIA the data from the government because it may not have been kept from the app itself. So that's, that's, a, that's a takeaway. Um, next slide, please. Do we have a, uh, Judge Matthewman is asking a question. Let's see, can we see, let's see if we can see. The company allows its employees to use an ephemeral app. Could it be argued that the company is intentionally trying to avoid future discovery obligations? Of course. I see no reason why an organization would use an ephemeral app as an enterprise-wide tool, but it happens. So, for instance, if you're using Slack, um, because you discover that your marketing department really likes to work together and they like to work in Slack and it's not a tool that the, the organization has used, they decide to embrace Slack, but employees are deleting the data and the corporation hasn't yet caught up with the technology. There's a lot of apps that come out that organizations are trying to, to catch up with and maybe an individual has, has made a decision that all of their data, everything that they do in Slack gets deleted every five minutes. The organization may be unaware, but I'm telling you now that, that, that you've got to put that legal hold in place. So you should be aware from that from this point moving forward. And you know, um, one comment I have on that, I had a case last year where we were looking at public records under Florida law and whether apps that were being used by public employees uh, that had communications, whether we could get that information or whether that information had to be kept. Uh, because it was a public record and then produced as a public record. I found a case, I, I don't have the, the site in front of me, but I think it was out of Oklahoma or one of the states in the center of the country. And, and there was a, a, I think it was the governor or somebody high up in one of the states, where they had, they had adopted a policy where they decided to use one of these ephemeral apps. And, and because it was a policy that they were allowed to use it and there was no expectation of keeping it, I think the, the Supreme Court in that case decided that they didn't have an obligation to preserve and produce it. So, well, I'm so guessing can, that you're talking about the normal course of business argument, right? Whether or not in the normal course of business you would keep this data. And right. so what I'm really talking about is the technical aspect of it is whether or not when you say an app is disappearing and everything is disappearing, is it disappearing in three minutes or is it disappearing in three days? And how do you find that data if it has actually... But I agree with Judge Matthewman. If an organization is intentionally using an ephemeral map, app, uh, app, I would guess they are trying to delete data. If the organization can come forward and make an argument that they really can't pay for storage for things that they think are not related to any business purpose, and so employees are using a chat um, functionality of something that goes away and is not preserved, that is perfectly legitimate. The federal government has apps um, and chat apps that are not preserved. Um, because employees just want to eat text or chat with one another about lunch, and you don't want to use a general record schedule to keep billions of chats about lunch. It <laughs> eats up storage, it eats up resources, but you have to look at really why this was put in place. And so I agree with, I can't see the rest of Judge Matthewman's question. Let's see if I can find it here. Um, does it matter if the disappearing app is used before or after the date? Of litigation. Well, I'm going to guess it. Yeah, <laughs> that is a that is a, a really um, that's a great question. I guess if you put an ephemeral app in place after litigation has begun, I'm going to guess there's a spoil, spoliation argument coming. <laughs> but I'm going to let the judge handle that. Yeah, <laughs> so I want to talk yeah. a little bit about um, regulated industries and ephemeral apps. If you are in a regulated industry, like you are a financial institution or you are an institution that protects, um, that, that does credit card, uh, some sort of financial transactions or medical or, you know, railroad transportation or, or any industry that is regulated, you need to check with your regulators for guidance with regards to use of ephemeral apps. Why am I telling you to do this? because we are seeing regulators are issuing guidance. So for instance, the Security Exchange Commission, the SEC, has put out guidance on whether or not a regulated um, industries can have, um, can use ephemeral apps. I, I don't know, I'm not gonna talk about what each of the agencies says because each agency has the rights to, 
to, to, to issue guidance with regards to its industry, but you need to check that to make sure that you are not um, violating guidance by your regulator. So that's, I'm just going to say that that's, you know, some general rule. We can go to the next slide. Let's talk a little bit about the cybersecurity, um, some cloud security and cybersecurity issues really quickly with regards to privacy. Um, and so as we start to build out, you can go to the next slide, as we start to build out pushing more data to the cloud than everybody, like everyone's pushing everything to the, to the cloud, you should look to see that there are some new developments. So New York State has issued a cybersecurity regulation. Um, you're going to see that cybersecurity, privacy, um, and all of these rules around data are going to start to overlap. So you're going to see privacy uh, requirements, even if it doesn't use the term privacy, you're going to see those in, um, in uh, regulations by the states. So New York has a new cybersecurity regulation. The federal government has the NIST cybersecurity framework. Now NIST has issued a privacy framework uh, with regards to just privacy. The privacy framework from NIST and the cybersecurity framework are meant to work together. You cannot implement one without the other. They are meant to be used in tandem. And so like Debbie said earlier, if you're having some sort of issue that you're going to have to try to figure out, like GDPR, you should really start with the stuff that you know the answer to and get on that separate track with the things that you know you're going to have to try to figure out. I'll give you a quick example. Um, the Volkswagen case that the government had, that the Federal Trade Commission and other agencies had to go after Volkswagen for, there's a huge GDPR issue. Why? Volkswagen is a German company, but it had a a subsidiary here in the United States of America. The issue was really whether or not um, Volkswagen had misled American purchasers with regards to how these vehicles worked with regards to, to all of its um, emissions and all of that. Um, the data that they wanted, they thought was in Germany. But if you do what Debbie has advised you to do, and that is look at the data that's, that's where you can get to it, you'll find what you need in many instances. As it turned out, all of the advertising data for Volkswagen was right here in the United States sitting on a server that was related to the advertising company, a third party. So you didn't even have to get the data from Germany. Um, and so the, the whole German lawsuit went away and they went after the American subsidiary. So what Debbie advised you to do is very important. Go after the, 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 the parallels that you need to go after until you resolve the GDPR, the cross-border issues, and follow the framework here in the United States. There is also a new program. It's called the Association of Corporate Counsel Data Steward Program was issued um, out of the Association of Corporate Counsel in 2020. That is a cybersecurity program for law firms, corporations, and, um, and vendors. Uh, it is designed to meet the needs and the requirements of the, these new cybersecurity protocols and regulations. A lot of the ISO, the NIST, the FISA, a lot of these cybersecurity rules that, that really help you in the privacy landscape can be resolved by, by, by joining up through the Association of Corporate Counsel Data Steward Program. And I'll leave it to you to find out where those are. Chris? I want to mention one other thing. I, I want to give David Horrigan credit for circulating this last week. Yeah, last week, yeah. the, the ABA issued, they call it Formal Opinion 498 on virtual practice. So if you're sitting there and you're looking for wow. some kind of guidance, uh, obviously the ABA is not binding on a Florida lawyer necessarily, um, but it's a very helpful resource for virtual practice of law. Uh, it's got some great suggestions on how to, um, how to practice and, and some of the issues that are coming up. Uh, as, as people are working remotely and trying cases remotely and taking depositions remotely, doing all of those different things. So I just wanted to make sure we didn't go uh, without mentioning that formal opinion 498 from the ADA. If you Google it, it's there. I don't know if we have it in our materials online. One last thing, I do want to mention one question we had come in. Um, it goes back to an issue in California. So Debbie, maybe you can answer this. Um, it, the question was, does California statute deal with opt out of information obtained by a company of another entity or person, or is it if you don't opt out, you're opting in? 
don't yeah. know if that makes any sense. But yes. So, ba <laughs> so basically, remember that uh, California law is a consumer-based law. So that's based on the data that a company collects or has about a consumer. And typically in the U.S., it is a um, uh, opt-out, not an opt-in. So, uh, so the the company or corporation co can collect your data, but you can opt out of data sale or data sharing. So that's pretty much how that law works. Uh, one, one last point I'll make is that a lot of these privacy shifts that are happening are really trying to join purpose of data, the mm -hmm. purpose of using the data to the data. So as opposed to in the past, we had a situation where people were collecting tons of data and then trying to figure out what they were going to do with it. The shift right. now is find the purpose, connect the data, and then that's how you uh, can comply with a lot of these privacy regulations. Very good. Well, I, I know we're out of time. I, I know we could keep going on longer here. I know there's a whole day of privacy discussion ne uh, tomorrow uh, from the UF conference, uh, but I see Bill has appeared here, so I'm going to have to end it there. I want to <laughs> thank my, my panelists, Taylor, Debbie, Brian, Kenya, and thank you, Bill, for inviting us all to, to participate today. Thank, well, thank you, you all. Thank you this for being a, a great moderator. This was just a tremendous panel of chock full of important information. That distinction between uh, consumer rights from the American perspective or the U.S. perspective and human rights from the European perspective, you know, makes all the difference when you start parsing out how we're going to handle this. And thanks to the panel for helping clarify that for us and, and digging into the weeds. Really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to go and take our final break right now. Uh, and then we have the, uh, the concluding panel, Don't Go Away, it's social justice panel. Uh, this, you don't want to miss this. This is one of the reasons we're in this business is to do good. And we want to see how we can do better. So please join us at 5 o'clock. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.